Tonight again we're considering the miracles of Jesus, some aspects of Christ that we see in them. The miracles of Jesus describe, or shall I say portray, different uh, aspects of the kingdom. If just uh, four cursory things to note that Jesus has power over all illness, all manner of disease. <coughs> You notice that there's all different kinds of afflictions that he has said to have healed. He has power over death. He raised the dead. He has power over circumstance. He could calm the storm, walk on the sea. And he has power to provide. That's what we're going to see in this uh, miracle Amen. tonight. Now these are things we don't just want to make a doctrinal point. We believe this. This... You really want to strive to see this in your heart, be convinced of this, because you'll need some grace in most of these areas here uh -huh. at some time. So the Lord Jesus has not changed in this regard. Tonight we're going to look at the feeding of the 4,000. We've seen, we've considered the uh, 5,000, tonight the 4,000. And this is recorded in two different, two different gospel accounts. So I'll read both of them. The first is Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse 32 through 39. <clears throat> then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days, and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples said to him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to feed so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes, and gave thanks, and brake them, and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. <coughs> and they that did eat were four thousand men beside women and children. Mm -hmm. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. Amen. Then in Mark, the eighth chapter, the first nine verses, in those days the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude. Because they have now been with me three days, and they have, not, they have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. For diverse of them came from far. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? <laughs> And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes. And he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about four thousand. And he sent them away. And straightway he entered into a ship with the disciples and came into the parts of Dalmuth Nutha. Well, quite an event. The background of this event was when many multitudes that came to Jesus, we dealt with this last week, and he had healed many of them, healed their sick. Great multitudes of people with all kinds of diverse diseases. So this is after a rather busy occasion, remember they put him down at his feet and he healed them. All sicknesses and blindness, deafness, dumbness, 
people with diverse diseases, and he healed them all. Now the multitude is remaining there. This had extended, we find, over a period of three days. You might read this uh, account where multitudes came and cast their feet at uh, their sick at his feet. Now, this might have been in the one evening or one afternoon, but this this took three days time. This is sort of a three-day mini revival. And uh, all these people stayed. That itself is a sort of a phenomenon. <laughs> They all stayed. This wasn't a schedule. Remember, this was not a scheduled meeting by men. Not a scheduled meeting. They hadn't expected to stay this long. They all ran out of food. So the scriptures make a point. There was nothing to eat. Nothing to eat. And Jesus, wanting to involve his people, as is his custom, calls his disciples to him. And, and here's what he told them. He said, well, they, I have compassion on the multitude. I, uh, they've been with me now three days, and they don't have anything to eat. <clears throat> this aspect of Christ, his compassion, this is a part of Christ I would like to have more of. To be able to be touched with uh, the needs of people. He had compassion on the multitude. He was <coughs> under no obligation by the law of Moses to do something like this. And yet he, sort of his reward for people staying with him so long. Amen. Compassion on them. His heart was moved toward them. He wanted to help them. His mercy reached out toward them. He was tender toward them. When they were at their weak point, he, he saw this. And he was very sensitive about it. You notice he said, they've been with me. He didn't say they've been with us. They've been with me now three days and uh, I'll not send them away fasting we're told by Mark that many of them had come from very far a great distance and he said if I send them away empty they'll they'll faint they'll succumb by the way they, 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 they just don't have enough strength to make it you should of course be able to see a picture here of the way it is with us we have a long we've come from a long way too Except we're not going back where we came from. We're headed toward another place. Amen. But it's, it's too long. It's too long to make without some nourishment from the Lord. He'll not send us away empty either. I will not. I will not send them away fasting or without food. <clears throat> well, the disciples <laughs> said, oh, when should we have so much bread? Where, where are we going to get the bread? Matthew and Mark both have them saying this. When shall we, when shall we find so much bread? We're, we're, we're going to get this. You know, this same thing happened approximately three months earlier. Three months before this he, is when he fed the 5,000. And they made the same observation back then. In Mark 6.35, when the day was not far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, they may go into the country round about into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered, Well, you give them to eat. They say unto him, Shall we go buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? And then later Philip said, what? What is this? We can't feed this multitude with this. And you remember that a young lad was there, and Philip said, Well, there's a lad here with five barley loaves and two fishes, but what's that among so many? Ah, uh, what three months can take away from you? Now they raise the same question again. No one remembered, apparently, this uh, incident of feeding the 5,000. The 12 baskets that were taken up empty, uh, taken up fully, they didn't remember this at all flesh does that to a person uh -huh. see these people these were primitive times here these people weren't born again yet these disciples weren't born again they hadn't received the holy spirit yet they didn't talk like this after you understand after pentecost they didn't talk like this yeah. but this is this is the way people talk we're in the flesh it doesn't make any difference how much they've seen how much they've heard flesh just can't pick up on on this 
And this must have uh, this must have, must have had an impact on the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. To know his disciples were there and he it was a pitiful sort of a situation. So he just asked them, same question he asked them when they had the fed the five thousand. He said, How many loaves have you? I got most pictures they will hum. How many loaves do you have? Let's go back to zero again. We'll ask the same question. How many loaves do you have? Both gospel writers tell them that they 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 answered, we have seven, and then one Matthew says we have a few a few little fish. Well, last time we just had two, so we got a, we got more loaves this time and more fish. How's that? And yet the crowd's smaller. How's that? You would think it would be proportionately if you had five loaves and two fishes for five thousand. You would think maybe you just have need four loaves and one fish for four thousand. But that's not that's not the way the things of God are plotted out. So they had seven loaves and a few little fishes. Now it doesn't say he said bring them to him, but they did. They brought them to him. And here's the events as they sort of opened up. Jesus, first of all, he said, oh, make the command of the people to sit down on the ground. Everybody sit down. I've got something to work with here. Sit down. Sometimes, you know, when we come together, it's good to ask yourself, I wonder if anyone has something tonight. And then sit down in expectation. How many loaves do you have? And here's what Jesus did when he received those loaves. They brought them to him. He took the seven loaves, and he gave thanks, and he broke them. And he gave to his disciples to set before them, and they did set before him, before them. This is rather elementary what I'm going to say here. But I've noticed over the past two years that there are many people who eat food without giving thanks. I've noticed it's like a trend. Jesus never did do that. He gave thanks with these seven loaves. It looked like they were thoroughly insufficient. What is that among so many, the disciples would say. But he gave thanks. I remember a thought count of a man that was said to be very poor. He was in a time of deep depression. And he found a, a couple of scraps of bread and a piece of fish to eat. When he gave thanks, he said, Father, I thank you that you've ransacked land and sea to get this food to me. Actually, if you can see it right, that's the way it is, brethren. He gave thanks, <coughs> sanctifying it. The scriptures say food is to be received with thanksgiving, but then that know the truth, know and believe the truth. And it's sanctified. Food is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. That's what makes it legitimate to eat. Sanctified by the word of God doesn't mean you read the scripture over. It means God said you could eat it if you gave thanks for it. It was sanctified by the word of God in prayer. You remember Jesus told his disciples one time, if they ate anything deadly or drank anything that was deadly, it wouldn't hurt them. Sometimes you'll be in parts of the world I have been where I literally didn't know what I was eating and drinking. And I gave thanks. God, oh, that's a kind of a protection. You, there's been a lot of people that just have died eating. Uh-huh. Good thanks. He gave thanks. And the disciples were involved in this. He didn't say, everybody come forward and get as much as you can. The disciples distributed it, set it before the people. you got to get a picture that was like an orderly presentation before them. And then he, there were some fishes, and he, did, he blessed them separately. <laughs> Mark says he blessed them separately and set those out. So he had a nice two-course meal there. And then the scriptures say that they all ate and were filled. Everybody did, young and old alike. They all ate and were filled. Mark says, so they did eat and were filled. So you get the picture, they kept on eating until everyone was had sufficient and were full. This was not a snack. These weren't hors d'oeuvres. This was a full meal for the people because they were going a long distance back home. <clears throat> and they took up the fragments Seven baskets full. Now you can't you, you can't systematize things like this. You could try it. I tried to proportion this out, and there's you couldn't 
figure this out mathematically. I could have 12 baskets when you started with five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 and have 12 baskets, and then you had 4,000, you distributed seven loaves and a few fishes and had seven baskets. See, you can't figure it out mathematically. You can't systematize what God does at all. Amen. It doesn't fit into rules of men at all, proportions of t statistics. A statistician, he couldn't work with this. Couldn't work with this at all. You can't figure out the ways of God. They're beyond, they're beyond figuring out like that. Mm -hmm. Fewer people, fewer remains. Started more, ended less. See, you can't, you can't figure these things out. You just accept them. That's the way God is. And you'll find when he works in your life, you'll find you can't put a pattern to it at all. 4,000 men, the scripture says, beside women and children. And then, and only then, he sent them away. He filled up something to talk about on the way home. I'd like to go home talking about being at a banquet, started with seven loaves and a few fish, and he fed 4,000. They give you something to talk about on the way back and give God some glory. And then the scripture says, he entered into a ship and left for another area. Matthew says the coast of Magdala. Mark says the parts of Del Manutha. Both of those were cities. Magdala was on, a, on the shore of the Galilee on the western side, and Del Manutha was close by, so he headed for that other area. The day's work finished. These were areas in uh, Syria. Now, I wanted to make a few observations about this, about this incident. The closer a person is to the world, and the more they reason after the manner of men, mm -hmm. the more quickly they forget what God has done. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Actually, if you are, this is a good practice to get into, is to rehearse to yourself and to God the things He's done for you. Go back as far as you can. Go back as far as you can and rehearse what God has done for you. And it will sometimes confound you what, what a, a marvelous things He's done and what a plentitude of them there are. Well, rehearse them because I'll tell you, the world has an eroding effect on the memory. You can remember what some what some wicked person did to you, and easily forget what God how God has blessed you. Mm -hmm. So here were these disciples. Three months they were active months. Now these weren't three months where they went over into Arabia and was away from Jesus for three months. They'd been with Jesus every day for three months, and yet they forgot this incident, which was like an epoch. It's like <laughs> it was the first time in the history of the world that something like this happened, and they were there and actually distributed the food, and actually gathered up the fragments, and you say, how could anybody forget that? Well, they forgot it. They, they couldn't make the correlation that Jesus could supply food at all. You'll find that that's, that happens to you when you get absorbed into the course of the world, and it can yeah. suck you into this what we call a vortex, like a whirlpool, pull you right down into it, and you can't connect your need with Christ. Jesus generally starts, too, with what's available. How many loaves? What, what, how many we had to work with this time? You know, to me, this is like a check to their unbelief. They actually had more loaves this time than they did last time. You would think, say, Ooh, this is really something. We've got more than we did last time. You know, if Jesus was to ask you, what, what do I have in your life that I can work with? It's what you they ponder. What would you say? Because he will take an inventory. If you want the Lord to bless you or direct you or heal you or comfort you, he'll ask, oh, what, what, what have I got to work with here? So with Moses, what's, what is that in your hand? What have we got? Well, it's a rod. We'll, we'll use that. You, put a, you, you take a rod and you put it in anybody's hand but Moses and it didn't do anything. But in, a, in the hand of the man of God, God uses what you have. You may have some ability or some uh, talent or some understanding or some desire, some aptitude that would amount to nothing in anybody else. But if you will let Christ use it, mm -hmm. 
you will find it's a lot greater than you dared to imagine. It'll be sufficient, perhaps, to feed a lot of people. So he starts with what's available. And he does provide only for those who remain with him. Now, Jesus said, these people have remained with me three days. All right, they received something. I don't know whether others left or not. I wondered about that. If some had already, if they did, they missed out on this. Yes. Because he didn't tell her, take along a few extra loaves, all of you, for the people left early. <laughs> this wasn't it. The people remain, get more. Have you not found it to be so? Do you know that there, it is possible for a person not to spend enough time with God to really get anything. They just are there long enough to kind of see a little here and there, but they're really not there long enough uh -huh. to receive what they need. These people stayed long enough. Amen. And Jesus, uh, he would not send them away fast. And Jesus will not, if you will spend long enough time with him, he won't spend, send you away fast. If you will be like the importunate widow and keep going to the unjust judge and saying, avenge me and my adversary. If you'll be like the man keeps knocking on the door, let me three loaves. He will not send you away fasting. That's not his manner. And he didn't these people either. And those that are Christ's disciples, they are the distributors. If you want to get something from God, you're going to have to get it from one of his people. Unless you're one of his people, then you get it too. But they, this is how God distributes things. If someone wants to hear the gospel, somebody that knows it has to deliver it. That's the way it is. If the Ethiopian eunuch wants to understand, so it's going to be distributed to him by the Lord Jesus through Philip, one of his, one of his disciples. And divine supplies, their purpose is to keep you from fainting in the way. Divine supplies are designed to strengthen you and make you able to stand the rigors of the trip from here to glory. When we have nothing, <clears throat> this is no restriction with Jesus. This is no restriction with Jesus. When your well seems dry, this is no restriction with Jesus. It's with you it is. It's not with him. Or if you just feel like you just have a very little, it's not really adequate, just a very, this is no restriction with Jesus. It's a restriction with us. So when they have just seven loaves and 4,000 men beside women and children, this is no, if they only had one, he'd have done it with that. He has no restriction with him at all. Now, that seems very elementary, but it might... Sometimes it uh, sort of boggles my mind how a person can get down, discouraged and down because they, of the small number of resources they have and they ponder it and it gets uh -huh. them cast down. Well, the best thing when you've got just a sparse amount of resources is to take them to Christ. That's Amen. the best thing to do and Amen. then he'll multiply them. And as I mentioned, you can't systematize divine workings. I can imagine that a, a person who wanted to go by methodology would say, now if you want Jesus to work a miracle, you've got to at least have five loaves. You've got to at least have five, and if you could have seven, that would be, that would be good. And, but see, this isn't the way God works Amen. at all. David, you remember, picked up five stones when he went to do battle with Goliath, but he only used one. Yes. Because Goliath did have four brothers. I've often pondered that perhaps he put those in there in case he faced the other four sons of the giant, they were called. He only used one, that's all. And uh, you will not be able to put a pattern on how he does things. And if Jesus gives thanks for food, how much more should we? Amen. How true, how true it is. Look, it would look small, you would think, this is the Lord of glory. Give thanks. Well, thanks. Somebody thought enough to bring the food. We could thank for that, too. Someone thought enough to bring along some loaves. Just like the first time there was a lad there, someone, someone thought enough to bring something. And that God was gracious enough to, to bring some supplies that he could multiply. And because of divine abundance, there's always plenty of fragments. Actually, you can practically live on the afterglow of a great blessing from God. You can see it. So they gathered up the fragments and then he went away. Another day's work in the life of the Lord 
healing multitudes of people, spanned over a period of three days, intense activity, but it did not take away Jesus' sensitivity. Now see, I have an affliction here. When I become worried, my sensitivity kind of gets dull. It wasn't so with Jesus. Amen. It was not so with Jesus. No matter how much activity he's been engaged in, he's still sensitive and compassionate and will not send the people away empty. He has command of the situation at all times. Even when he was in the body, to say nothing of now that he's in the glory without any hindrance at all. So I urge you to ponder this miracle of the feet of the 4,000. And sometimes you may be like a nameless face among a lot of people, like these 4,000. Well, that doesn't mean you can't be fed. We don't know the names of any of these people. No names at all. I've, uh, perhaps many of the people that were healed were there. That would have been like a double blessing, to be healed by the Lord and to be fed by Him too. That would have been a, a double blessing. So wherever you are, if you're in the presence of Christ, you may be among other people. Look to be fed. Look to be blessed. Look not to leave without being blessed by the Lord.